Hi, grade 11 learners. This session will be on animal diversity. Let's just have a look. If you, I have a simple illustration here showing you just some of the variety of animal species that there are. For us, just to note that we have at least 35 phyla present. Uh, on the planet at the moment, and what we find is that uh, s some uh, some species you know you do know have become extinct. But what we find is that for our purposes, for the syllabus, we will be looking at six of the phyla. But I'll get to that now. The illustration before you, you can see, is very simple. Here you have snails, spiders. Here we got kangaroo. Um, your dinosaur, your dinosaur fossils, fish, etc. So it just gives you an idea of the vast array of animals that we actually have on the planet. Luckily for us, we'll only be looking at six of the phyla. So what are we going to focus on? Well, we're going to look at the classification of living organisms. Remember, we did it in grade 10 last year. We looked at the five kingdom system, so we will just refresh that. We look at characteristics of animals, all animals, including humans, homo sapiens. And then, as I mentioned previously, the sixth phyla that we are going to study is the phyla porifera. They are the most primitive of the lot, to be specific. They actually increase in complexity in that direction. So this is in increasing complexity so that complexity increases so what does that tell us that uh, phylum porifera is the most primitive of all animals on the planet and this uh, these include sponges and I'll show you some examples later on the second phylum is nadaria it used to be called slenterata and these include the hydra. The third one is platyalmintis. These are your flatworms, of which planaria is a very good example. Annelida are the roundworms, and they are represented by a very common example, your earthworm. Orthropoda. The largest of all the phyla in terms of diversity. They include, for example, a class called insects. There's another class called the arachnids, you know, the spiders. So it is quite it is it is quite vast in terms of its diversity. And then the phylum chordata, and here we would have humans as one of the examples of phylum chordata. So those are the six phylums that we are going to study. Let's go to the next slide. You will constantly hear me refer to the importance of terminology or definitions. Now do remember that all terms, actually all words, are, or many words, especially in science, they are quite loaded. In other words, there's a lot of detail that is included in just those few letters. Let's just look at some of the important terms. The first one is referred to as vertebrates. Now your vertebrate basically refers to animals that have a backbone or you can just feel at the back here your vertebral column. So those are your vertebrates. Invertebrates are animals that do not have a backbone. So you can see vertebrates and your invertebrates. We will be discussing symmetry. Now the symmetry basically 
basically relates to the fact that certain organisms like ourselves can be cut through the central axis of the body, can be cut into two identical halves. Not all organisms, not all organisms exhibit this symmetry. So, if we look at asymmetrical organisms or asymmetry, that means the body cannot, very important, cannot be divided into two identical halves. So, the A, of course, in science means not. Radial symmetry is the next type. They can be divided into two identical halves. And what is unique about it, along any plane but through the central axis. Bilateral symmetry, bilateral symmetry, that is what we as humans exhibit. In other words, we can be cut into two identical halves like the radial symmetry, but there's one slight difference. It is only along one plane. So if you look at a human, you can see that we can cut him, you can cut uh, her, him or her down the middle, down the middle, and that's the only plane along which they can be cut into, into two identical halves. That means my right hand side will have the arm and the fingers, same on the left hand side. I will have one eye on this side, one eye on that side. So that, that is basically what we're talking about when we're referring to symmetry. So we can only be cut along one plane, which, makes, uh, which gives us a bilateral symmetry. Then we are going to discuss the germ layers. So those are the layers that develop in the, in the embryo. There are three basic layers. And the first layer, uh, the derm here, refers to the germ layer. So you can always just make a note, that's your, that's your germ layer or your layer of tissue. And then, and then we get to ecto, which means outside. So this is the outer layer of the organism. So in our embryo, it is this layer that eventually gives rise to our skin. If we look at meso, meso means middle. There you can see it's the middle layer. And then, of course, endo, we all know, means inside. So that is the inner layer. In, all, in, in animals, we have, a, we have a body cavity. And if that body cavity, that space, is very important, completely lined with the mesoderm, which is, if we go back, which is this one here, your middle layer, then it basically means that that organism has a body cavity or it is referred to as a silo. The humans, you and I, we have silomes in our bodies. But we do have other organisms that are acelomate. In other words, they have no silom. And remember, the A in front refers to not. Then if we look at pseudo silomates, pseudo means false. In other words, let's just have a look at this one. It has a body cavity. It is lined with mesoderm but it is not completely lined with mesoderm. And that is the major difference. See, there's a mesoderm. It is lined with, sorry, the body cavity. It is lined with the mesoderm. But very important here is that it is partially lined with the mesoderm. So that means that organism would, ex uh, would be referred to as a pseudocellumate. Silomates, basically just another name for the organisms that actually have this silom. And then last but not least, to mention an important structure which indicates the complex complexity of the digestive system, and that is a through gut. So what we find in very primitive organisms, there's one hole 
through which food enters and the waste product leaves. But as it beca organisms become more complex and eventually gets to the more, most complex of all organisms, the Homo sapiens, you and I, we find that food enters via one hole, the mouth, and of course leaves through the anus, all the waste leaves through the anus. So what happens is, or what we do is, we refer to that as a through gut. So what you'll also see is that many of your primitive organisms don't have a through gut, where more, many of your advanced organisms actually have one. So just having a look, there are two openings, which is the easiest way to identify the through gut. In other words, there is a mouth and there is an anus present. Let's move on. Right, so I mentioned to you the classification that we did in grade 10. And just a reminder that we start off with the group Monera. And remember, Monera includes your viruses, your virus and your bacteria. Then we have the next level, and again, it's increasing in complexity in that direction and then in that direction. So I'm, I'm starting with the most primitive in the Five Kingdom system, and that which is Monera, and we then go to the next level, which is your Protista. Your Protista, they are unicellular organisms, and the most popular example of a unicellular organism in this case is reference to the amoeba, uh, the amoeba, and the amoeba is basically an organism that is made up of, in other words, the entire body makes up only one, is made up of only one cell. We then get to the fungus, and we know popular examples of the fungus, which would be, for example, mushrooms, which many of us eat. We also find yeast that we use to make bread, that is also an example of a fungus, and then even something like athlete's foot. Athlete's foot is caused by a fungus which you find in between the toes. Plants, we do a section, we completed a section on plant diversity, so you should know, so you should know quite a bit about this. Your plants, of course, all indicated by certain characteristics like having cell walls around the cells, having chloroplasts present in most, etc. So those are characteristics of your plants, and these includes all the groups from your mosses or your bryophytes to the pteriophytes, your ferns, to the gymnosperms, which includes your cycads, and finally, to the angiosperms, which is the most advanced of the uh, specimens in, or the most advanced group in the kingdom plantae. And then finally, the most, the most advanced organisms in the five kingdom system is, of course, the kingdom animalia. And you can see there, from that word, you get the word animal. And, of course, we as humans, are very good examples there. Right, so this is just a little, an additional uh, classification, just indicating there you can see the five kingdom system. So you have your Monera, Protista, Plantae, Fungi, and Animalia. What has now happened is, it, there is a constant improvement in science. So what we now have is the three you can see here the three domain system, which includes your bacteria, your archaea bacteria, and then your eukarya. So your eukarya would then slot in. In other words, all these groups would then, uh, all these kingdoms would then slot in there. Okay, just indicating, and you can see here's the question mark, because it's under constant review, the question is, but how, how much further will this develop? For us and for our purposes, for our curriculum, we basically need to know the five kingdom system.
So, let's look at some of the characteristics of animals. They have all the features of living things. And remember, I know it was drilled into you, especially uh, grade 8 and 9, the characteristics like the fact that it is, it, there's ingestion, there's excretion, cellular respiration takes place, movement, etc. Remember, there are seven requirements, and your animals fit all of those seven requirements. So the second characteristic of animals is that they are eukaryotes. And if you look at the prefix eu, it means true. The karyo refers to nucleus. So that means it has a true nucleus. What does that basically mean? It means that the nuclear material, your DNA, is basically surrounded by a nuclear membrane. Then we have that all animals are heterotrophs. Hetero, of course, means different. And troughs referring to feeding level or feeding. So they get their food from a different source. Remember, all plants are autotrophs. And the autotrophs basically mean that they produce their own food. In this case, the source of food is different. In other words, they get it from another source, which makes them heterotrophs. They are multicellular, multi meaning many, so they have many cells, and we'll see some examples. And then going back to some grade 10 work, remember, they don't have any cell walls. They don't have any cell walls. There are other structures like proteins, etc., that actually provides additional support. They are they have a lot of excitable cells, and one of the uh, one example of the cells is, for example, in our bodies, we have receptors. We have receptors in our skin that can detect uh, temperature changes, that can detect chemical changes, that can detect uh, touch, etc., uh, etc. Et and last but not least, the animals mainly reproduce sexually. So what you would find in most animals is that you would find a male of the species and then of course also a female of the species. There are examples, there are examples where um, it's not sexual. Uh, for example, in the case of the sponges, which we'll speak about now, which actually have the ability to regenerate. But we'll chat about that later. Okay, just a little, just a little interesting fact. Remember, we mentioned the two definitions: the vertebrates and the invertebrates. And just to mention that ninety-five percent of all living animals are actually invertebrates, while only five percent are vertebrates. So what we consider to be the more primitive of organisms like your insects and all other little hojas and stuff, they actually make up, uh, they actually make up 95% of all animals on the planet. And then you'll see the more advanced animals like mammals, fish, birds, reptiles, and amphibians, they make up only 5%. Right. Right. So, just to mention that for the syllabus and for exam purposes, we are going to look at six of the selected phyla, which I have already mentioned. I will be, I will be, there will be a lot of additional information, but what I want you to focus on, and I'll actually provide a little summary, where you'll actually see that the focus of the six phyla is the following. What type of symmetry is present? How many different tissue layers are there? Remember, we did some of these definitions already. Do we have a coelom present or is it absent? And then last but not least, do we have the presence of a through gut or is it absent? So that will be 
that will be the focus of what you need to study for exam purposes. Right, so I will just have a quick look at some of the definitions just to make sure that we have a good understanding. Mentioned previously, asymmetry basically means the body cannot be divided into two identical halves. Radial symmetry, or these, these uh, organisms are grouped together and they are called the radiata. They can be divided into two identical halves along, there we go, that's the word I was looking for, along any two-dimensional plane. So, if I just scroll down a little bit here, there you can see an example of a sea ane uh, anemone. And you can see, through the central axis here, I can cut it into two identical halves. Through two identical halves. I can even go through here, two identical halves. And this organism is one of the organisms that then exhibits that then exhibits radial symmetry. So to just give you a sense, asymmetrical cannot be cut into two identical halves. Radial symmetry can be cut into two identical halves along any plane through the central axis. Let's go back to the last one there, bilateral symmetry. Like radial symmetry, they can be divided into, into two identical halves, but along only one plane. So that would be you and I, as I mentioned previously. But let's just take another organism exhibiting bilateral symmetry. So you can see this organism can be cut along different planes, but it won't necessarily give it two identical halves. The two identical halves is when it is cut from this point here, cut all the way to there, and then you'll see, as an example, there you have these locomotive structures. So there would be the one rear on that side, one rear on that side. One front structure, one there. One eyeball here, one on that side. So that means... Because it can be cut along only one plane into two identical halves, it is considered to be or have a bilateral symmetry. Next, we're looking at our germ layers. Basically, it's just a fancy word indicating how many layers of tissue do we have. Now, in terms, of, in terms of reproduction, we know we have the sperm cell and the egg cell that come together. It then forms a zygote, and the zygote then starts dividing. It divides, uh, it uh, becomes a marilla, and there are different stages. But when it reaches this stage called the blastula, what happens is you start seeing that there is an invagination of tissue. You can see a grouping of cells, remember, single cells. When grouped together, same structure, same function is called tissue. So here you can see an inv uh, invagination taking place. And now what you find is this bluish lay on the outside would now be referred to as your ectoderm. So that's the outer layer. This yellow layer, which is now on the inside, is referred to as the endoderm. And then, as mentioned previously, your middle layer. So the middle layer would basically be in between your ecto and endoderm. And that you can see here uh, are these red cells present there. Okay. So those are the three layers, and you basically need to identify in each of the six phyla which of these layers are present, if they are present. Siloam, your body cavity. But remember, it is the body cavity, or it's only referred to as a siloam, when it is completely covered 
or lined by the mesoderm. So if we look here, you see your A, I mentioned to you previously, means not. So it's not is alone. So there's no body cavity. And there you can see one of the phylums as mentioned. Platyalmintus, sorry, is the phylum. Then pseudo, meaning false, so it's only partially lined. And then your cellomates, they have a completely lined uh, psyllome, in other words, completely lined with the mesoderm. So just to give you an idea, there you go. You can see there's your flatworm, the planaria. And what you find is there's the ectoderm on the outside, yellow the endoderm, uh, sorry, uh, the red the endoderm, and then your mesoderm, but there's no body cavity there. If we look carefully here, we'll see your roundworms. You see there's a, a pseudoseal. In other words, what you find is there you have your mesoderm, but the mesoderm only lines part of the psyllum or the body cavity. Last but not least, there you can see you have your psyllum there, and you can see there's your body cavity. So you can see it is completely lined by the yellow tissue, and the yellow tissue then, of course, indicates your mesoderm. Through gut, mentioned previously, but just to show you an illustration here, is there you, I think this is the rabbit's um, digestive system, and just indicating that there is a mouth through which ingestion is going to take place, and of course an anus through which egestion or defecation is going to take place. So, that indicates that food will basically move through all these structures and eventually leave through the anus. What is the advantages? Of course, food can continuously be taken in. You can constantly eat as the food moves. In other words, you need a unidirectionally towards the anus. But more important is this last aspect here. And that is that you can actually have, as we have in the case of humans, we can have specialization. So we know, remember from gate 10, that the stomach performs certain functions. The small intestine performs certain functions. The large intestine performs certain functions. So that is quite unique, especially for more advanced animals. And that is why, sorry, that's one of the advantages of having this through gut. Let's go through each of the six phyla that you need to study for exam purposes. So the first one is, if you look at the screen, the first one is the phylum porifera. And examples would be, here yeah, you can see these are examples of sponges. And I think the most popular example of a sponge, everybody at least knows SpongeBob. So he would be an example of the phylum porifera. They are very simple. Now, when they mean simple, they mean uh, lowest level of complexity. And they have porous bodies. In other words, their bodies have little holes in. And you'll see now how they basically, uh, I'll, I'll mention how they basically feed, which is important, especially as you see that they are filter feeders. So what happens is they would, the water would be, it would basically be sucked into the body. And then as soon as the nutrients and whatever is needed is, is captured by the keanocytes, then what would happen is it would then leave the body through those same pores. There are keanocytes. I'll show you a picture of them now. Keanocytes and amoebocytes. Now the amoeba, as I mentioned previously, is of course one of the protestants. It is a single cell which has the ability to take on any shape. Primarily responsible um, for, of course, feeding, so that it does by phagocytosis. So that's the same 
that you get in this case here. And then just to mention, very important, very important, especially for modern science, is that the periphera actually have the ability to regenerate. So if I take this, if I take this sponge that's here, and I cut it up into one, two, three, four, five, six pieces, if I place it in an environment where there's enough nutrients, in a short while, there will be, let's say in a week or two, there will be six copies of that exact same sponge. So that is what makes, what makes them quite unique. They are very primitive, the most primitive of, of all the animals, but on the other hand, they do have the ability to regenerate. So, just having a look at this, all you need, just need to see here is just some information. As I mentioned previously, you have the, um, you have the, the porous body. So, you'll see here are these pores. So, what basically happens is, as water is pushed out here, other water, it would then be sucked in. And what would happen is, here you can see the cyanocyte. There you can see the cyanocyte, and there you can see the amoebocyte. You, if you listen very carefully, you may have picked up, there was an, I've, I did not mention endoderm, ectoderm, or mesoderm, which basically means that it only has this one very primitive layer. So, what do we need to know? Just another example of a sponge. Also just indicating to you one of the important aspects, especially in terms of symmetry. You can see that this entire body of the sponge, there is no way that I will be able to cut that sponge into two absolutely identical halves through the central axis of the body, which basically means that your sponges are asymmetrical. Next, they do not have any tissue. They have a grouping of cells, which could possibly be considered to be one layer of cells. If they don't have any mesoderm, quite obviously they can't have a coelom. And because they are relatively primitive, they won't have a through gut, and they do not have a skeleton. So those are the, and let me just mention, that these are the important aspects that you should know for exam purposes. Right, our next phylum is the phylum Nidaria. Now the phylum Nidaria has some beautiful examples here. You can see as an example here your sea anemone. And the one just a little bit further down, there's a beautiful example of a jellyfish. So these would be some of the examples of the phylum Nidaria. They are the simplest animals that have, that actually have tissue. They have a radial symmetry, which basically means if I go back and I look at, for example, the sea anemone, what I can do is I can simply take the sea anemone or the jellyfish, let's just take the jellyfish, and what happens is through the central axis, I can cut this jellyfish into two identical halves. I can, but that would make it bilateral symmetry. If I can do it through any plane, that automatically means that this organism would have a radial symmetry. There are two types, uh, or just two forms, this is just for interest sake. Your polyps, in other words, there you can see, this would be an example of your polyps. And then, of course, you have the, if I can just erase this, this would then be an example of the medusa form, your jellyfish. So, you don't need to know any of this in any serious detail. The only reason why I'm just adding this is just to show you that 
the few examples mentioned are not the only examples. There are a lot of different classes. Remember, you also did this in grade 10, where we looked at kingdom, phylum, subphylum, class, genus, species, and all those goodies. So you can see that there are other classes present. There are other classes. So there you can see your sea anemones would fall under the anthozoa class, while your the Portuguese man of war or the jellyfish that you saw would fall under the hydrozoa class. So there are still many, many different types of nadarians that are present, especially in marine environments. So there we go. There you have your, uh, your Portuguese man of war. There you can see the the medusa, uh, the, the jelly-like section, and these are actually the tentacles, and there you can actually see, if I can just change this, there you can actually see the dead fish, which has been stung, and which, of course, will be consumed later. On my right here, this organism is referred to as the hydra, and what you see is, here is the body, here is the body, and these are tentacles. And what it has actually done now is it has actually captured it has actually captured a little water flea which it will then consume. So what do we need to know for exam purposes? Already mentioned, it has a radial symmetry. Remember the radial symmetry? It has two tissue layers. It has an ectoderm and an endoderm. Ectoderm and endoderm means there, and so there's no reference to mesoderm. So automatically it means that there would be no, there would be no silome present. And finally, there is one opening. In other words, what happens, for example, in the case of the hydra here, this water flea will be forced into its digestive tract. In other words, it will eventually be lodged here somewhere. And after digestion had taken place, what would happen is the waste products would then be forced, would then be forced out through the same opening. Okay, let's have a look at the third phylum, Platyalmintes. Just a reminder, these are the flatworms. And what you'll see is they have, they have a muscular feeding tube that extends out of the body. So you can see that it has a complete gut which branches off. And if you look at the body down below, quite unique is that you'll see a, the flatworms are hermaphrodites. So what you actually find is they have ovaries and testes. And remember, one of the characteristics of all animals is that they reproduce sexually. That does mean that there will be female structures and male structures. And in some cases, you actually find uh, certain organisms, like your tapeworm, the Tania solium, actually has the ability to, uh, to self-fertilize, where most organisms uh, tend not to because it keeps the gene pool small. So this is the platyalmintus, just, an uh, just a little picture there of the planaria. And again, just showing you, there yeah, we had the one that, that you may have discussed in looking at parasites, the tania solium, which is the tapeworm. Um, just one of the parasites, and you can see that many of these, many of these flatworms, many of them are, or they are primarily parasites. They are different groupings. Um, the blood fluke, the blood fluke is also, is also discussed. Remember, the blood fluke is the flatworm that actually uses the human body and the snail uh, as, the, um, as an intermediate uh, host. So the humans and the snails 
are actually the hosts for the various stages of the blood fluke, of the blood fluke's life cycle. Again, you don't need to know any of this, simply indicating that there is a vast amount of species and it is, and this phylum itself is quite complex. So what do you need to know for exam purposes? Let's get back to the exam purposes. Platel Mintes. You can see there in our little illustration. You can see in our little illustration there. It has a bilateral symmetry because there's only one point at which it can be cut through the body. What you can see is there are these eye spots. One left, one right. So these are primitive form of, forms of eyes. And what, what that basically means is you will then take, you will then have to cut it through there, in other words, to get two identical halves. There's no other point at which you can actually cut it into two identical halves. And just to mention, there's the mouth with the, there's the mouth with the muscular tube, the muscular feeding tube that extends outside the body. You can then also see the digestive tract that we spoke about, which extends right through the body of the planaria. So let's get back. It has a bilateral symmetry, which basically means it can be cut into two halves through only one plane in the body. It has three layers of tissue. In other words, it has endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. All three layers are present, but although it has the mesoderm, it has no cellum present. And last but not least, as mentioned, and I just indicated it here, is of course the fact that there is only one opening. So the food would enter. The food would, uh, so that's where the food would enter. And in some cases you find that some of these, some of these worms actually get rid of some of the, some of the waste through diffusion through the body. Our next phylum is the phylum Annelida. Annelida, to just summarize, would simply be your roundworms. Remember our previous phylum was the phylum Platealmintus, which are the flatworms. So here you have worms that are a bit more complex in their development. Um, so that would be your phylum annelida. Just having a look here, you'll see that it has a silom which serves as a hydrostatic skeleton. What that means is that the liquid inside the inside that body cavity of course prov uh, provides additional outward pressure which then helps to maintain the shape of the body. It has a complete digestive system, so that already tells you if it has a complete digestive system, it would have a mouth and an anus, which means it would have a through gut. It has a closed circulatory system like us humans. In other words, the blood is always present inside the blood vessels. It has a well-developed nervous system, if you, uh, if you play with uh, simple examples like your earthworms and you just, any physical touch, would, you would get an immediate response, which means that their nervous systems are uh, well developed. Also, their fluid balance system is also well developed, which is something similar to what we have in our bodies, in other words, the excretory system that you studied earlier. Just look on the right hand side. Just to show you some examples of some of these roundworms, there you can see a leech. If you, I hope you can see this. Here you have the finger, looks like the finger or, th uh, or thumb of somebody. And you can actually see that there you have the leech that has actually attached itself uh, to the person's thumb. And of course, being a parasite, it will of course now attempt to ingest some of the blood. Right. Looking at the next level, again, this is not for exam purposes, but just to indicate that it is more complex than just a few examples. So you have a few classes, your oligochaeta, your polychaeta, 
etc. And then you'll find that here you have, for example, your earthworm. And here in this group, you have, the, you have your leeches, which you'll see there's flat bodies. And, of course, they are primarily, they are primarily parasites. Again, you do not need to know this for the exams, just to indicate that there are a lot of classes under each of these phylums, which basically means that there will be a, a great variety of species under each of these phylums, although we are only referring to a few of them. Then in summary, your roundworms, the annelida, they have a bilateral symmetry. In other words, cut along only one plane into two identical halves. There are three layers. That, of course, would be your endoderm, and then the ectoderm, and in the middle you would have the mesoderm. There's a psyllome present, which uh, mentioned previously, which provides additional support to the body uh, because it acts as a hydrostatic skeleton. There's a mouth and an anus, so there is, there is a through gut present, we do mention that there is no skeleton present. There's no, in other words, there's no bone or cartilage skeleton present, but it does have a hydrostatic skeleton. So it does have a hydrostatic skeleton, which is of course, which is of course one of the functions of the coelom present inside this organism. Our next phylum is the phylum Orthropoda. Orthro, meaning joint. That's why if, uh, people refer to uh, arthritis. The orthro means joint. And the poda means leg or appendage. So, what we have is just some examples there. You can see the lobster. There's a barnacle. It's the largest phylum of all animals. It has a bilateral symmetry. And you can see now it's becoming, as these organisms are becoming more and more complex, they tend to exhibit bilateral symmetry. The coelom is reduced. So, it doesn't have a complete coelom. And in some cases, for example, in the case of your insects, you find what's called a hemoseal. And if you, you may have encountered this when you did an introduction to the blood vascular system, looking at certain organisms having an open blood vascular system. That basically means that at some point the blood will actually leave the blood vessels. Where we as humans have a closed blood vascular system, which basically means that the blood always stays in the blood vessels. Then, of course, they have a nervous system, which is very close to that of the annelida. And the annelida, of course, indicating the roundworms. Just to show you, just to show you, just an idea of the different classes. You can see there's your, you have your crustaceans. That would be your crab family. So that would include your crayfish and your crabs, your prawns and shrimps. Those of you who like seafood, they would fall under that group. All spiders, remember spiders are not insects. They belong to a different class, the arachnida. You may have seen the movie or heard of arachnophobia. People we have an intense fear of spiders. And then, of course, all associated, like your scorpions, your ticks, etc. Then you have your myriapoda. Your myriapoda, basically, they are your centipedes and your millipedes. And an easy way to distinguish them is that your centipede only has one pair of legs. And they are sometimes the poisonous ones. Your millipedes, your millipedes are usually darker in color. In many cases, in many places like Kuzulu Natal, the Cape, etc., you find these uh, dark or black millipedes. 
And what you find is that they have an enormous number of appendages or legs. So that would be your millipedes as compared to the centipedes where you can actually see the individual legs much more clear. And then, of course, insecta, you can see, is a totally different class, which includes your housefly, muscular, domestica, and other organisms. So you can see that these are some of the classes that makes up one of the, that makes up the largest phylum in the animal kingdom. So, let's summarize what we need to know, for example, purposes. As I mentioned, bilateral symmetry, because they, become, they are the more advanced uh, organisms. Three layers, endoderm, ectoderm, and mesoderm. Mesoderm, of course, lining the body cavity, so we have a silome present. They have a through gut present, and then important, and uh, most of you do know this, is of course it does have a skeleton, but it is an exoskeleton. And the exoskeleton, in the case of many insects, consists of chitin. Now, if you've accidentally stepped on a cockroach, you may have heard a crackling sound. So that is the exoskeleton, in other words, covering or protecting the outside, that is basically breaking. Where we, on the other hand, have an endoskeleton. On the, other, on the other hand, we must also mention that, for example, in the case of your crabs, you find that the exoskeleton also consists, will also contain, for example, certain amounts of uh, calcium carbonate. Our last phylum is the most advanced of all the organisms, and it is phylum chordata. So looking at this phylum, what happens is in the embryonic stage, you have a structure called the notochord which develops. And as the fetus develops further, it will eventually develop into a vertebral column, indicating that, of course, it has a skeleton, which will, of course, be inside the body. In other words, indicating we have an exoskeleton. We have a hollow dorsal nerve cord which will eventually develop into our nervous system. And then, as I mentioned previously, linking those two, we have an exoskeleton. The gill slits that are present in the embryonic stage is not important this year, but it's important to mention because it is, cons uh, it is considered to be evidence uh, for common ancestry. In other words, considered to be evidence for evolution. And last but not least, uh, just a bit of trivia, it, uh, we have a post-anal tail. Now you'll see this for, as an example in organisms like dogs, where you actually see the tail. We human beings also have a gene for coding for the tail, but what happens is the gene is not active or switched on in inverted commas, so that's why we don't, that's why we don't develop the tail. Um, it is considered, also as part of our discussion on evolution, it is considered to be a vestigial organ. So just having a look at some of the classes, again, we don't expect you to know this for exam purposes, but just to get a sense of the complexity of the different phyla. So there we have the diagnatha, which are basically your very primitive form of uh, fish, they are what we refer to as your jawless fish. And then, you remember last year we did the chondrocytes. So chondrichthys is basically fish that have skeletons of cartilage. Include, they, they would include our sharks, rays, etc. Other fish, osteo, Osteo, remember the osteocytes in the bone? So the osteo would then refer to fish that have skeleton made of bone. Amphibians, we all know, including your different frogs, uh, bullfrogs, etc. Your reptiles, from your puff adder to your cape cobra to your lizards, etc. So we all know. These are, they are well known. The class Avis, which includes your birds, 
including our national bird, the blue crane. And then last but not least, of course, we have mammalia, which includes us as humans. So, what do you need to know for exam purposes about chordata? Being the most advanced, it will of course have a bilateral symmetry. Cut along only one plane into two identical halves. We have three layers of tissue, ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. And because we are the most advanced of the lot, it means that the mesoderm will of course line, completely line, the body cavity, so there would be a psyllome present. We know that we have mouths and anuses. In other words, we have two openings in our digestive system, which basically means there would be unidirectional movement of food and waste, which means that we have a through gut. And mentioned previously, we of course have a skeleton which is present inside the body, so we then exhibit an endoskeleton. Now, to summarize, what I did is I put it in a single table. And uh, just a little bit of advice. When studying, for example, all the different plant groups, as well as the animal groups or animal phyla, it is best to put it in a table. And I have been asked, but what's the best way to study it? To actually look for common features. Just as an example, just for me to highlight, I'll just show you that if we look at the Annelida, the Arthropoda, and Chordata, you'll see that they all have bilateral symmetry. They all have three layers. They are all cellomates. They all have a through gut, and they all have a skeleton. So what it basically means is what you study for the one applies to all three of them. So you can actually, you, what you can actually do is you can actually consider this to be one package. The slight difference is that the annelida, as mentioned previously, has a hydroskeleton. Orthropods have an exoskeleton and we as humans have an endoskeleton. But so what you know for, in terms of what you must know for the exams, in terms of symmetry, number of layers, silome, through gut, and then skeleton, all of it is the same for the annelida, the orthropoda, and your caudata. The next thing I would advise you to do is to look for commonalities between the other groups. So... Look at this. You'll see that these three groups do not have skeletons. There's a commonality. Okay? Then you'll also see that the Nidarians, if I can just change this, the Nidarians only have one opening, your Platelmintus only have one opening, and actually your Periphera also only has uh, one open uh, doesn't have one opening. Remember, it has a porous body. But now you can see that you can group together, and then of course what you can do is you can group that together. You can then also see. Look at this. There is another commonality between these three. So you must decide how you how you going to put this together. The idea is, for example, if you look at the silo, the Three bottom phyla in terms of uh, level of complexity. In other words, your periphera, nidaria, and your platelmintus, none of them have a silome present. In other words, they are all acylomates. Uh, the three more advanced phyla, there you can see, they are all cellomates. So what you basically then do, have a look here also quickly, as I mentioned, the, the symmetry, it's only periphera that is asymmetrical. Only periphera. So there is a little key. Nadarians are the only ones, the only phylum studied that has a radial symmetry. The rest you can see 
has a bilateral symmetry. So these are the little, so what eventually happens is you may not even need to study the entire table if you can just have these little key phrases like, in the case of symmetry, periphery is asymmetrical, nadarians are, uh, ray, uh, exhibit radial symmetry, while the others all exhibit bilateral symmetry. So that would then cover instead of memorizing absolutely everything. Then you can see, look at the number of tissue layers. The, uh, uh, the sponges having one layer, most primitive of the lot. Let me just get another color there fast quickly. Uh, there we go. Has one layer. Unidarians have two layers, and the rest have three layers. So, my advice for you would be to use this table. Use this table after you've read through most of the information. Use this table as a study aid. And based on that, let's go and start with our questions. More important than knowing the answer is, of course, how we get to the answers. So I'll just give an indication here. We have, you know, the column A, column B. In other words, basically matching them up. So, phylum of fish. Now, if we look at this list here, I can tell you, although you don't need to know this, I can tell you that F and G are both classes of fish. The first one, remember in the grade 10, we spoke about chondrocytes, which we found in cartilage. So what that actually indicates, that's fish, where the skeleton is made up of cartilage, for example, your, your sharks, for example, the great white, cocarid and cocarius. And then G is also a group of fish. And remember in grade 10, we spoke about the osteocytes, which we found in bones. So these are also a group of fish. And this group of fish, their skeleton is made up of bone. But these are two classes. Uh, if you look very carefully at the question, you see the question refers to the phylum, which automatically means that the correct answer in this case will, of course, be H. And I'll just indicate the correct answer there. So H would then be the correct answer for the phylum under which fish would fall. Then we have animals with amoebocytes. And again, I'm indicating they are animals which we're dealing with. So you underline. So this is the things, these are the little things that you do in, in the exams. And you can see there you have your amoebocytes. And remember the amoebocytes. If you, easy way to remember the amoebo and the cyanocytes, just connect it to SpongeBob the cartoon character which everybody knows, which of course means that it would fall under J, the kingdom Porifera. So that would be the answer there. We have segmented worms. That's the next one. Uh, 1.3, segmented worms. Now you know that there are two groups of worms that we discussed. The one is the flatworms, that is the platyal mentors. And then, of course, we also discussed the phylum annelida. And we've all seen an, uh, seen an example of an earthworm. And that would, automatically, that would automatically make B our correct answer there. Let's look at the next one. A group of animals with a definite vertebral column. And it has an internal skeleton. Now, what they've done here is you can, actually use, you can actually use one of two answers here. The first answer can actually be, of course, the phylum. Oops, it is The first answer can, of course, be the phylum chordata which would be H, that would be correct. But what you can also see is, if you look at the various options, you actually have E here also 
as an example. And remember we mentioned when we looked at our terms and definitions in the beginning, we spoke about, we spoke about the vertebrates being uh, organisms that have a vertebral column. So H and or E can be the correct answer there. Animals, next one. Animals with an exoskeleton. Animals with an exoskeleton. Remember I spoke about the cockroach that you may have accidentally stepped on, which fell, which means it falls under the phylum Orthropoda, which makes I the correct answer for question 1.5. Last but not least, question 1.6. Bilateral worms with a coelom. So again, this is what you should be doing in the exams. Bilateral symmetry. And it has a coelom. So we have two types of worms with the bilateral symmetry. We have the, we have the flat worms of the platyalmintus. They have a bilateral symmetry as well as the round worms of the phylum Annelida. But your, if we go back to the table, we'll see that the platyal mintus does not have a coelom, while the Annelida has a coelom, making the correct answer in this case B. Good, let's continue. Now this is, a, this is a possible type of question that you'll find. We've spoken about, uh, in the presentation, we've spoken about certain animals which are quite common. Of course, as an example, you can see everybody at least knows that would be an earthworm, that would be a lobster, crayfish, and that of course being fish. So these are relatively general. The important thing is that you should be able to connect them to the six phyla that we discussed. So it's very important to know at least two to three, uh, well, also hopefully South African examples of organisms that would represent each of the six phyla. So let's look at the question. The question says, to which kingdom, very important, do all the organisms belong? Now here we're talking about kingdom. Remember so far, primarily, for this presentation we've been speaking about phyla. Now we're speaking about kingdoms. And remember, we have, we have different types of classification, but for, for our curriculum we basically use the five kingdom classification system. So do remember, starting at the bottom, in other words the most primitive, you would have the kingdom Monera, so that would include your viruses and uh, your bacteria. You would have your kingdom protista. And don't forget, they would be your single cell organisms. Then you have your fungi. Here examples would be mushrooms, uh, including uh, uh, something like athlete's, uh, athlete's foot where you of course have the fungus that is present in between the toes. So that's, those are all examples of fungi. Um, then we have the kingdom plantae. And last but not least, we have the kingdom animalia. And remember, in terms of complexity, that is how it, how it develops. In other words, the lowest level of complexity would be at the bottom. Monera, and the highest level, of course, would be Animalia. So, if we go back to our question, it says, and that's why I specifically uh, encircled that, it is not the phylum we're looking for, it is the kingdom we're looking for, so our correct answer in this case would be the kingdom Animalia. Let's look at question 2.2. Now they refer to three, important three, and you'll see in the exams that when there's reference to three, that is all that you must give. 
please remember this is an examination rule for the entire FET is that if three, uh, three answers are requested, you must only give three. If you give five, what happens is the teacher, and even at grade 12 level, what we do is we mark, we only mark the first three. We don't even look at the other two that follow. So important, if you have five possible answers, the idea is that you take time and figure out which three of those answers would be most correct. So, we're looking for three characteristics of the kingdom, in this case, Animalia. Now, I know you're going to say, but hold it, we didn't study, we didn't study this uh, characteristics. But don't forget that this is a general, this is uh, somewhat, uh, a little bit of general knowledge. Or what you could simply do is, you can relate it to, as an example, the difference between the plant and animal cells that you studied. So, uh, characteristics here, as an example, they would be multicellular. This could be one example. Multi, the prefix, of course, meaning many. So there are many cells in the animal body. Um, what else can we say about animals? We can say that your animals, as an example, their cells have no cell walls. And you see, I'm, ju I'm jumping around now from what could be common knowledge there to what is specific knowledge that you studied in earlier grades. As an example, to add to that, we can say, but there are no plastids present. There are no plastids present. In other words, if you think about things like chloroplasts, uh, you, don't, you generally don't, you don't find green animals that can photosynthesize. You may find green pigmentation, but the pigmentation doesn't necessarily in uh, uh, indicate that there's chlorophyll present and that photosynthesis can take place. So here we can also look at the fact that it is complex. It's a complex organism, etc., uh, etc. Et so this just gives you an indication that you can be specific, as I indicated here with the asterisk, specific in terms of prior knowledge, uh, the cells, etc., or general knowledge, for example, the ones indicated with a little circle. And we can even mention things like animals exhibit movement. They would exhibit a, a much higher metabolism, etc., etc. So let's move on to question 2.3. Now they ask you to identify the organism labeled A. So they have A. Remember they're asking identify the organism. So we're not talking about phylum or class or any classification. They simply want you to know, at least know, that it is the earthworm. Now we get to the detail. And now you can see, if we look at question 2.4, it says identify, and in this case, the phylum of organism A. So now we know it's the earthworm, but do remember in exam, uh, in exam conditions, they don't necessarily need to ask you what the organism is. They can jump straight to a question like 2.4, where they presume that you know what this organism is, and you will automatically then be able to identify the phylum. So in this case, the phylum, as we know, is Annelida. Let's go to 2.5. Here we go. They ask you, 2.5 asks, list. So you must basically name them. Name what? Again, only five characteristics. Now remember when we spoke about this, uh, sorry, the five characteristics of what? Of the phylum. So they don't want you to talk about the organism, so give five characteristics of the earthworm. They want you to give 
five characteristics of the phylum to which the earthworm belongs, which we now know is Annelida. So I just want to take us back to the table. There you go. So if we look at the table, we are looking at the phylum Annelida. So when we talk about when we talk about the five characteristics, there you go. There you have all five characteristics. And if I take it up a little bit further, just a reminder that if we look at the characteristics, we must know the symmetry, the number of tissue layers, the psyllome, whether it has a through gut or not, and whether it has a skeleton. So, if you, look at the, if you look at the table, the table gives you a nice compact answer and it basically then tells you that, and this is what you would then write out in full sentences, you would then say that the phylum of course has a bilateral symmetry. It would always be good to explain what bilateral symmetry means, so I'll just add that the bilateral symmetry means that it can be cut along one plane through the central axis into two identical halves. We then also find that we have three, all three layers present. We have the ectoderm on the outside, endoderm on the inside, and the mesoderm, of course, in between. But what we then find is, because there's a mesoderm, and the mesoderm completely lines the body cavity, we then have a celome present. In other words, this organism is then referred to as a celomate organism. I indicated previously with my simplified drawings that the earthworm has a mouth through which the food enters and an anus through which the waste products leave. So that means that we have a through gut present. And then it has a skeleton present, remember the three more advanced phyla, in other words, Annelida, Orthropoda, and Chordata, all of them have a skeleton present. What we have in the case of the earthworm is that you have a hydroskeleton present, in other words, the, what you basically have is you have water inside the body that helps to maintain the shape of that organism's body. Let's move on to the next question. So here they ask you to identify again. You should do this in the exams. Identify, so that's your verb. The organism labeled B. So for us, you can call it a crayfish, lobster, okay? It belongs to the crustacean family or crustacean class. So let's just say in South Africa we call it crayfish so that would be the organism indicated there next they ask identify the phylum of this organism so the phylum to which it belongs is of course Orthropoda. Again, as I mentioned previously, it, is, it, would all, it would be good to know at least three examples, preferably South African examples, of each of the phyla. Let's move on to question 2.8. Here we have list five characteristics very important, not of the organism, but of the phylum that represents this organism. And we said in the previous question, 2.7, that the phylum is orthropoda. So if I must take you to the answer, making it very easy for you, there we go. We come back, we come back to this table. And you'll see most of what we need to know comes, uh, brings us back to this table. And so what we can do is, we will highlight it, there we go, and there's your entire answer. So, let's just go through each of them individually, indicating that it has a bilateral symmetry, which means 
cut through one plane through the central axis into two identical halves. Only one plane. It has mesoderm, ectoderm, and endoderm. Because it has the because it has the mesoderm and it completely lines the body cavity. It, it has a celome, so it's celomate. It has a through gut, and then it has a skeleton, and to be more specific, it has a skeleton with a protective coating on the outside. In this case, it is of uh, the the, uh, uh, the crayfish. The skeleton is made up of calcium carbonate and not chitin, as in the case of many insects. Let's move on. Okay, identify organism labeled C. So at least everybody will know that's a fish. So I think that's relatively easy. You don't need to be specific in terms of identifying it. If we go to our next question, 2.10, it says identify the phylum. So what phylum represents this? So we have six to choose from. And the one in here you can see, just to indicate, you can actually see that on the inside there you have the skeleton. And if you heard, I gave you a little hint. On the inside you have a skeleton. So it has an endoskeleton. So the phylum in this case would of course then be chordata. Next question. List five characteristics. Again five and only five. Characteristics of the phylum represented by this fish. We know the phylum is chordata. And I'm going to say it again. If we go and we look for our answer, there we go. You've heard it so many times. So just indicating to you that using this table would be the best way to study the content of this chapter. So if you need to write it out, you would then indicate it has a bilateral symmetry. It has the three dermal layers, meso, endo, and ectoderm. It is celomate because it has a celome. It has a through gut. Your fish would, of course, eat whatever, whatever nutrients it is. So it would enter through the mouth. And then you have uh, a structure at the rear where you, of course, release all the waste. And then, as I indicated to you, it's inside where you find the skeleton, which of course may be, which may consist of bone or cartilage. So I hope that the theory and questions that we went through in this presentation will be very useful to you and assist you in preparing for the final exams. <laughs>